that's the uh, that's the CrowdStrike website, but uh, that's not the topic of today's video, right? <laughs> There's a lot that happened in the last few days when it comes to IT, but what I really wanted to talk about was if you're into our app development, especially iOS, then I do want to talk about something which you probably know about, and that's that Swift is a mess. Yeah, the Swift language, and you know, I love coding in Swift, don't get me wrong, it's a nice language, but it's a mess at the state in the state that it's in. And the reason it's a mess, and I'll describe the few places where I think that it has problems. <clears throat> and actually, it is not uh, the structured concurrency. The structured concurrency piece is actually pretty good. Now, for 99% of people who are working with uh, Swift, you don't need structured concurrency. You're writing an app. It doesn't need to be parallel. It doesn't need to be concurrent in many different ways um, to the extent that you need to enforce it. Right. You can use your standard kind of like async await in the old style of doing it and just run off the main thread and do the back, let the background threads do what they need to do without worrying about actors. That's particularly useful if you're doing uh, stuff that's on, off on a background thread related to say something like Bluetooth, something like that. Um, actors, however, that's where some of the confusion comes in because it enforces certain behavior that ends up having you to consider how to do things in a concurrent way without breaking the app. <clears throat> but most of the time, you don't need to use actors, right? You don't actually need to do that unless you're doing something that is highly performant, needs to be done on a background thread, and then needs to be carefully analyzed. Uh, you know, say for instance, you're downloading 100 different images, you need to be done, you know, concurrently, uh, different uh, things are appearing on your view. But generally, most of the time, a lot of that can be handled by the standard st structured concurrency calls that you do. Uh, and most of the time, you won't run into problems. So one of the things that the new Swift language enforces is strict concurrency. Most, of the, most people are turning it off because they don't necessarily need it because it causes more issues than it, it solves in the sense that it doesn't let you compile it. Uh, many of the things that you do in the secondary or background threads, you probably do them through a third-party library, and that's fine. That's all good. The biggest problem when it comes to Swift uh, is how you generalize things, how you do abstractions. There isn't a set of clear rules that you do them in. <clears throat> and the reason that this has happened and I, is because it sits within a tight integration of the standard Objective-C uh, process and of abstraction, which was through kind of classes and through delegates where you had callbacks, and that backwards compatibility is kind of still maintained. Now, Chris Latner's interview with Primogen actually pointed out that he, you know Chris wasn't really happy with the state of Swift, and I kind of occur, I have to agree with him. <clears throat> and the reason I'm agreeing with him is because I've been using Swift for about ten years since the beginning, and the latest releases haven't really evolved the language so much, but they've added so much more complexity that doesn't really benefit. Now, the complexity comes from the way that they do type erasure, combine, introduce all these weird things, um, and so did SwiftUI. Uh, you know, the idea that everything was uh, a struct in SwiftUI meant that you needed to in include this like sum keyword for type erasure. There's a lot of problems with combine and the way that they type erased. Uh, they did the there, there wasn't this kind of problem when you had back in Swift 5 with Rx Swift. It was much easier to do, but it wasn't as tightly coupled and easy to represent in UI like Swift UI is. There's probably better ways to do it. But it makes, the outcome of that is it makes people who are working to, figuring out abstractions and how to abstract things, it makes it so complicated. You can use generics, you can use protocols, you can use generics and protocols, and you can use type constraints in protocols, and you can use type constraints in classes and in structs. And it's a mess, because you don't know which one to use when, and there are so many different options, and it truly has become a bit of a, a bit of a quagmire when you're trying to solve an abstraction problem. You kind of get stuck between, well, I don't really want to do generics because they're kind of frowned upon in the Swift community, but then, you know, when you do generics, it actually makes life a little bit easier. However, when you want to do type, uh, you, you know, you type aliases or associations, you do abstractions differently if you do them in classes than you do them in protocols. And that's the problem, right? There's two different ways to do abstractions. In classes, you can do abstractions by using a type class, right? You conform to a certain uh, type. And then you can work from there, right? But if you're doing protocols, and you try to enforce those behaviors onto different classes through extensions, 
you can't really do it. <laughs> you have to then use generics and enforce the type constraint on the classes, the, on the structure class that you want to use inside uh, the, the, I guess, the implementations of certain behaviors or protocols. Uh, and it causes all kinds of problems. There's so many issues related to compilation that are confusing. That's the other thing, like when you have a problem with generics or protocols, type constraints or type aliases or any of these things, to understand what the problem is, is never easy. All of that should just be thrown out the door and it should be one clear way to do abstractions. Uh, I think they've kind of messed it up with having like a, too many different ways to do the same thing. The other one is property wrappers. Now property wrappers in and of themselves they can be useful but they create functionality that's hidden behind something that you cannot debug, right? Like if you know property wrappers, you've used them, you can't debug them. It's really difficult to figure out what is the value behind the property wrapper and what it's actually doing and you can't step into the code that's doing whatever it's meant to be doing. So property developers hide this functionality and if you try to write them and you have bugs, it's just a headache. So I've seen, I've never seen anyone implement them really other than I think Swift Vapor uh, for something and, and Combine and nobody uses Combine anymore. <clears throat> so that's, that's uh, property wrappers are just, a, and they've been kind of left behind. They're kind of used, but they're not used. So kind of to replace property wrappers, you have macros. And the good thing about macros is you can kind of you can expand macros to see what they are, but you can't really debug them in place that when they're actually compiled. I haven't been able to step through code because it's compiled behind a macro. So then again, it's a problem. And the issue with these things is you have this magic happening behind the scenes and you don't know what it's doing and the outcome is uncertain. When you're debugging and when you have an app, when you have code, you want to be certain of the outcome of certain things. And I have to say in C Sharp, C++, and even Kotlin, Kotlin actually is just, Kotlin is pretty much just as bad as Swift in certain ways. But I have, I've been doing some C recently. I'm like, I really feel like just jumping back and doing like a nice C embedded device bit of code. It's actually clearer and easier to see what's going on when you have all the code there in front of you. Some of the syntax can get a bit of, become a bit of a headache. So you have things, something like C++ and C Sharp, and I have to say, I sort of prefer them with the exception of the lack of memory management. So there you go, there you have Java, right? So I have a feeling that Java is going to make a bit of a comeback. And that Swift and Colin, yeah, they're very specialized languages, but they're just, there's just too much going on. Python, you have Java and Python, they solve the pro their problems independently. There's a lot of stuff going, being thrown at Swift at the moment. I don't know where it's going to go. I love the language. I hope, I hope it continues and I hope that it does well. But really, that's, that's it. That's my rant. I know that you know, people feel very strongly about these things. <clears throat> and I've run into so many problems that I'm considering you know, kind of doing a bit of a detour after my current stint with a different language. What that will be, I'm not sure. Maybe embedded C... I actually really like embedded device, embedded C, maybe make a video game in C slash C++, native on, on uh, iOS, iPad, I've, I keep going back and forth with that, maybe not. And Python, and Python's like the kind of be all, end all, you can do whatever you, whatever you need. Uh, you know, there's Mojo, but Mojo's very specifically, again, for hosted machine learning uh, use cases. That's, that's what it's built for, and that's good. Leave it at that. Don't make it a you know, one language to rule them all because it's just be it'll just become a mess like Swift. It just doesn't work. Have a certain use case, have a language for that use case, let it solve the problem for the people that are using it. If you know one procedural language, you kind of know them all. And <clears throat> I think people should learn or take a, take a page out of Simula. If you haven't heard of that language, check it out. I'm going to do a deep dive into Simula. I want to share that with you because it's a language that is, let's see, 30, 30, 40, 40, 40, 50, 50 years old now, I would say, 50, 90, 60, 40, 50, 60 years old, geez, that's a old language, and it does almost everything that Swift and Kotlin do now. Isn't that interesting? 60 years ago, it's before I was born, before pretty, pretty much, I would say, all of you were born that are watching this. Anyway, thanks for listening to my rant. It's sad 
that I have to kind of point this out, and I've mentioned it on uh, on Twitter, and I've mentioned it on my uh, on Reddit, on LinkedIn, on all the kind of social media that really Swift is a mess, and I think you know Chris Latner also pointed that out. So he was the person who created it. So there you go. You know what's next? We'll see. I hope uh, Swift works out. I look forward to seeing you next week where I'll dive into Simula. And that should be an interesting exploration to compare it to what we have in Swift, what we have in Kotlin, and you know how that compares to a 60-year-old language. Anyway, thanks for listening. I'll see you at the next one. Bye.